Hello, everybody. This is Amanda, um, also known as King Camera Magic. And with me, I have Jeff Gray, who I'm absolutely thrilled to be talking to. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm glad to be talking to you, too. It's, it's an honor to be talking to you as well. Thank you. And for those of you who don't know, could you explain um, a little bit about who you are and sort of go from okay. there? All right. Uh, my name is Jeff Gray. Um, I have my Honor Your Oath YouTube channel. Uh, I started it back in um, late 2011 or early 2012. Um, I'm associated with uh, Carlos Miller with Photography is Not a Crime. It's uh, really an honor to be associated uh, with Carlos and Photography is Not a Crime. And I started filming law enforcement officers, you know, way back in 2011, quite a few years ago. Um, I wanted to film speed traps uh, and expose the speed traps uh, for, you know, I guess it was maybe a little naive back then. I thought maybe the cops would appreciate it. Uh, I was going to film the speed traps and, and famous uh, speed trap towns of Lottie, Florida, and Waldo, Florida, Hampton, Florida, and saw this little corridor on 301 in kind of north central Florida. Um, and I wanted to show the towns, I wanted to show where the cops hid, I wanted to show what the speed limits were, put that information out there so people would know it and uh, avoid getting tickets and avoid speeding through those towns. And that's kind of how it started. Oh, so the cops didn't appreciate it, huh? No, they didn't appreciate it at all. I wound up uh, actually getting arrested in Lottie uh, when, when I was holding. At that time, I, I kind of graduated. Well, my first time I went out there, um, I had an old, uh, is it okay if I just kind of go from here with that? that story? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Okay. So the first time I pointed a camera at, at cops was in Lottie, Florida. Um, it was a, I actually did not have a digital camera. I had an old VHS with a little miniature cassettes that you put in there. And the uh, first time I pointed my camera at, at the Lottie Police Department, I was filming where they were sitting. I was doing my little video on um, a speed trap there. Got surrounded, um, had my, tam my camera taken away from me. I was detained. I was afraid they were threatening to arrest me. They were th uh, threatening to take my camera. And uh, that was my first experience with, with cops in, in Lottie, Florida. And that video was never seen in the light of day because I think it's still on a little VHS cassette, a miniature VHS cassette. And I've never digitized it. I, I probably don't even know where it's at anymore. It's actually a pretty good video. Um, but that kind of woke me up and said that, you know, maybe these uh, cops aren't going to be too appreciative of me documenting what they do. And uh, uh, so I finally got a digital camera. And this was back when everything was kind of happening. YouTube was coming around. There was a lot of people out there filming the police. Um, it's kind of inspired me to do. I started my YouTube channel. I finally got a digital camera. But anyway, I got, I got arrested in Lottie for holding a speed trap sign. You know, I was like, Okay, if you guys are going to act that way, I'm going to get out here and hold a speed trap sign, and uh, uh, they wind up arresting me for it. So, did you get charged with a crime for that? That was back in 2012. And yeah, they arrested me uh, and charged me with resisting arrest without violence, and that is in Florida, the state of Florida. That's what we call the contempt of cop charge. Um, in other states, they they charge you with obstruction or interfering with law enforcement, things like that. But in the state of Florida, it's um, resisting arrest without violence, and the one thing that I will never understand is how can you be arrested for resisting arrest if you're not being in the first place? And uh, it was because uh, Officer Starling of the Lottie Police Department, who addressed me by name, he said, Mr. Gray, how are you doing? And I said, I'm good. He said, I need your ID. And I said, why do you need my ID? You already know who I am. Uh, and he said, because I need it. I said, well, I'm not going to give it to you. And he arrested me for uh, refusal to ID, which was the resisting which was his excuse for arresting me for resisting arrest without violence. Oh, okay. That was my first arrest. That was in 2012. It was pretty scary. Um, it was the first time uh, I'd been arrested. Uh, it was the first how long time. Were you, how long did they hold you for? Uh, they transported me down the road to the Bradford County Jail and start. Um, I kind of sat in the, I never actually went into the jail. Uh, they had like a little reception area, a processing area. I sat in there for about, eight hours, I think, eight or nine hours. And uh, my wife bailed me out, got me out. I don't remember if she actually bailed me out or if she, they just let me out. Um, but I never went into the jail or anything like that. So I, I think most people, would that would scare them to death. And they would say, OK, oh, I'm not going to mess with the police anymore. And you know, let's stay as far away from the police as possible. How come um, you didn't seem to feel the same way? <laughs> <laughs> well. It kind of had the opposite effect on me. It uh, made me want to get right back out there and do it even more. Um, I did have to work out a deal with my wife. Uh, I had to, she made me promise that I would always communicate with her where I was at and what I was doing. 
uh, because that day I got arrested and I was on my way home from work actually. <laughs> I was just swung by there on the way home from work. I was gonna hold a speed trap sign for about 30 minutes and go home. And they got a hold of me and took me to jail and my wife, she found out by making phone calls and things like that. And so anyway, I had to make a deal with her and say, you know, from, from that point forward, I always communicate with her, let her know where I'm, where I'm at, what I'm doing. So that's some really good advice for new people, I would think, is that if you're planning yeah. on doing audits, to let somebody know where you're going to be at before you do it. Right. If it's uh, if you're not married or whatever, if you're not a spouse, you just tell your friends, tell your family, people that support you doing it. Um, yeah, let them know that you're going to be in a certain place, a certain time. And once you start doing the, uh, I don't really call them audits anymore. I refer to them as civil rights investigations. Um, you're going to start the uh, you know, investigation at 12 o'clock and say, you know, I'll check in at 1, and 1 o'clock. And uh, if you don't hear from me by 1 o'clock, uh, this is where I'm at. I'm in this county. It would be most likely this, this law enforcement agency. And, uh, you, know, you know, give them enough details to know where if you did get arrested and you're transported to jail, that uh, somebody would know where you're at so you don't just disappear for a week or two or whatever. Right. <laughs> so let's go back to the First Amendment audit thing now. <laughs> if is it true that you're the one who sort of came up with the term First Amendment audit? Um, I don't know if it is or not. I, I don't know. I don't want to take credit for something that maybe I'm, I'm not responsible for, but. Um, so you're certainly the first person that I've ever heard use that term. Okay, yeah. Um, and I think Carlos well, said that you were the one also, so I just wanted to see if that was true. Okay. <laughs> well, if they say, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, I, don't, I certainly don't want to take credit for something if, if I didn't do it. But, uh, you know, I, I, it was kind of my idea. I'm not saying that I was the first person to do it, but it was my idea to go out and um, actually start going to places and filming them to conduct an investigation or an audit to um, see how they respected your rights. If they respected your rights, if they, um, if they understood the, uh, our first amendment right to film public employees and the uh, course of their duties and uh and you know my, my intention from the beginning was to go out document uh police stations and government buildings uh to see if they respected our rights to document public employees and why they're doing their jobs we have a right to know what the, the uh, public employees and public officials are doing on our behalf and our expense uh, and you know, document it put it on the internet put it on youtube and hopefully that would be enough for them to watch the video and say, hey, we need to make a change and uh, these people have a right to do this. Um, as a public employee, you don't have an expectation of privacy, especially while you're doing your job, you're, you know, you're operating on, on taxpayers' expense. Um, and, you know, over the years and through experience, you kind of come to learn that that's not the way public employees react most of the time. Most of the time they double down on my good friend, Joel Chandler, and kind of my mentor, one of my mentors, Joel Chandler said, uses the term they double down on stupid um, instead of instead of doing the right thing and saying hey we made a mistake uh, swallow our pride let's take steps to correct the issue a lot of times what they do is they do the opposite and they retaliate um, and uh, do the do the wrong thing so uh, that's problematic yes i'm so glad you mentioned that because um i know the personal experience in fact that was one of the first times i talked to you um i was recording some police in my area and they retaliated against me coming to my job and stuff like that. So you have personal experience with dealing with retaliation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What happened? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, retaliation. I've done public records requests. Um, and um, they put out memos and bulletins, the Florida Fusion Center, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI. Uh, mind you, I've never engaged in any unlawful activity it's always been perfectly lawful activity but they've distributed bulletins and memos claiming that i'm a sovereign citizen that i'm a domestic terrorist um they put false narratives in these memos and bulletins uh i, I published one a few years ago where uh, the florida fusion center distributed a bulletin and this is a you know florida department of law enforcement um but the florida fusion center they distributed this um memo that basically had my photograph uh, alerting people that, you know, law enforcement warning, sovereign citizen activity in your area. And it had a photograph of me and below the narrative was saying that um, I was arrested in Jacksonville. Um, I presented fake passports and fake IDs and uh, I fought well, with the police. Yeah. Well, they, they made a mistake by saying you presented an ID. <laughs> huh? For them, uh, right. you presented an ID. 
<laughs> right. So, you know, I mean, and that never happened. That just never happened. But nonetheless, you know, I've never fought with cops. I've never been arrested in Jacksonville. Um, and uh, I never f presented fake passports or fake IDs. And I've never claimed to be a sovereign citizen. And I'm not a sovereign citizen. You know, I don't have anything against sovereign citizens, but I, I'm not a sovereign citizen. And uh, but anyway, this memo was distributed across the state of Florida um, to all law enforcement agencies. So now if a, if, a law, if a cop doesn't know me and he encounters me and he's seen this memo, he's on edge. He's thinking, oh, this is a sovereign citizen. This guy fights with law enforcement and things like that. There was another memo that was distributed where I was actually filming a traffic stop in um, St. John's County. Uh, they were searching the vehicle. I was on my way to my mom's house in Hastings. I stopped and I filmed it. And later, through a public records request, trying to find out more information about what happened, um, they placed me as a passenger in the vehicle. <laughs> so I went from a guy standing across the street or down the street filming the uh, interaction to being a person in the vehicle. And this guy, I think his name was Edward Walter Novak. That's what it said on the report. Uh, he was arrested for having all kinds of different drugs, meth, cocaine, and stuff like that. Xanax. So does that link you to that then? Do they put that yes. stuff? Yeah, they put me as a passenger in the vehicle. He had all kind of weapons in the vehicle, all kind of, you know, kind of hard drugs um, in the vehicle. So that 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 bulletin was distributed across the state of Florida, and uh, so yeah, that's 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 retaliation. I, that's not a mistake. They didn't accidentally say, "Oops, Jeff Gray was a passenger in the vehicle." That that was intentional, in, in my opinion. And now that's been distributed across the state of Florida that Jeff Gray is a sovereign citizen who fights with cops, who rides with guys that have you know, meth in their car and, and weapons and things like that. So, you know. so how, I'm sorry, how oh, was the way that they, uh, they've retaliated, um, they have, they have called my job, they have contacted my, my employer and then, you know, uh, I guess a lot of people call it dry snitching. It's not like they call up and say, Hey, you know, you should fire this guy. They call up and they say, Hey, you know, I didn't know if you guys knew this, but this guy, Jeff Gray, he does these type of videos. He's, he's hostile to law enforcement. We thought you should just know that type of and uh, I'm blessed that uh, the guy that's my boss has always been, you know, we kind of were friends and we came up together and he looks out for me. He's like, as long as you do your job good here, you don't do any of this stuff on while you're on the clock, you're, you're good to go. So I've been blessed for that. I've got a good job. I've got a good boss. And everything. So how is all of this stuff, you know, with the going to jail, you know, all this, just taking pictures, the retaliation and things like that over the years, how has that like affected you personally? And how has that like affected your family and, your career and things like that. I mean, does it weigh it? Does that have a toll? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Um, you know, the other retaliation that I was trying to be, I was uh, working as a stringer for a while and, uh, stringers, you know, I don't know if anybody, if you're not familiar with what a stringer is, whoever's watching this, um, you get, you download an app and they, um, local news stations will contact this uh, company called stringer and they dispatch you out to, um, film, accident scenes or you know, newsworthy scenes that they can't get people to. And um, I was doing that for a while and I was going out and um, filming accident scenes and doing interviews with people during the holidays and really enjoying it. Me and my wife are enjoying it. And um, um, I believe it was the St. John's County Sheriff's Department kind of called and put a put an end to that. They scared him and said, you know, this guy, he's anti-law enforcement. So, you know, they, they stopped using me. They suspended my account. So. And I was making pretty good money doing that as a side side gig, making money and enjoyed it too, because, you know, you don't just cover fire, house fires and accidents and bad stuff like that. You go out and you, uh, during the holidays, you go to churches and you interview pastors that are giving, doing toy drives for kids and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun, but uh, that's over with now. Can't do it anymore. <laughs> because, that sucks, man. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I don't want to complain too much about it. That's, that's the thing, you know, if you're going to get into doing this, people should realize that all of this type of stuff comes along with uh, with with the gig. If you're going to try to hold your public officials accountable, they're going to retaliate and make life difficult for you. Good advice. <laughs> Good advice for sure. Um, you know. Yes. Um, what kind of positive things have come out of it with your personal experience? Uh, the most positive things that come out of it is when I have um, people contact me on my Facebook page or um, on YouTube to personal messaging. And by the way, anybody who has sent me a personal message and I haven't responded, I, I apologize for that. I'm not the best at um, getting on there and responding to messages and things. But 
you know, when, uh, when somebody contacts me and says, you know, Jeff, you know, I, I watched your video. It inspired me to get out and start doing it on my own or uh, just by watching your video has helped me deal with law enforcement and um, prevented me from being arrested or harassed or bullied. I knew how to stand down and, uh, um, and help them with, with asserting their rights and knowing their rights. And that's, that's, I like that the best. Usually, um, I'm sure anybody else that's done this for any period of time, you get kind of discouraged and kind of, you know, what's the point of all of it? And it seems like uh, as soon as I get ready to kind of hang up the camera <laughs> and stop doing it, uh, I'll meet somebody like, you know, a couple about a month ago, I was thinking about, yeah, what's the point of this? Well, you know, uh, I've gotten in all these reports on me out there and things like that. What's the point of it? And then I met a guy when I was at a store making a delivery when I was working and he recognized me. He was like, oh my gosh, you're Jeff Gray. I feel like I'm in the presence of a celebrity. I've watched all your videos. Don't stop doing what you're doing. Keep it up. Keep it up. So that, that's what I enjoy the most. I, I like to hear that I've helped somebody. Um, avoid being arrested or if they've been arrested, they know what to do after they've been arrested by uh, making a public record request and getting an attorney and things like that. So yeah, that's definitely what I like the best. Well, you've certainly influenced a lot of people, myself included. And every time anybody talks to you, a lot of these auditors out there, people that are recording cops and stuff like that, they ask, you know, who are some of your biggest influences and like your name is constantly being, you know, brought up. Um, and I mean, certainly influenced mine. One of my, one of the first videos that I've seen of yours that was probably still probably one of my favorite is when you were, um, there was a bunch of people fishing and then there was a lady fishing and she was, you know, they checked yeah. for the permit and can you tell us about that one or tell the yeah. viewers? Another situation. I remember later there was a second time I was out there and it was the same uh, female fish and wildlife officer. And she said something that allowed, she was I kind of felt bad for her because she was trembling and shaking. And I was noticed that in the video when I was filming her. And she said something about, you can keep following me around if you want to. And I was like, oh, hold on. I'm not following you around. You know, I'm not stalking you or anything. And that was just a situation where I was driving over what's called the Shands Bridge. And uh, the Shands Bridge connects uh, St. John's County, Florida to Clay County, Florida. I was on my way home from work. And it goes over the St. John's River. And I saw the Fish and Wildlife Commission out there um, uh, doing their thing, checking people to see if they had licenses for fishing, which is, I think is stupid. Um, checking counting fish yeah, yeah I, I, you know the whole you gotta have a license to fish I get it you know people will say oh well, you have to have that for for money well, no you don't you don't have to have a license for money you can you can get the revenue from other ways you don't have to make you don't have to turn something that's 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 a right you know the right to go fishing into a privilege by my licensing it but anyway um, <laughs> I saw them there doing that checking for the fish and all that stuff and checking people's licenses so I just I'll stop and get out and film it and that's all it was. It was just I was driving home from work, saw fish and wildlife officers out there doing their job. I just wanted to get out and document it and uh, put it out there for people to see how what happens, how they do their job, how they interact with the public, how the public interacts with them, and and not get involved in it or interfere in it or and interject myself in it, other than just standing there and documenting what and putting it out there for people to see. Okay. Um. Now, also, I want to mention one name, Thomas Covenant. Yeah. Thomas. Can you tell my viewers a little bit about who he is, in case they don't know? Uh, Thomas Covenant, uh, a.k.a. the Epic Old Guy. Um, and by the way, the Epic Old Guy moniker, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but the video from when I was in Georgia at... Uh, Lounge, uh, well, I was in Brunswick, Georgia, and uh, Captain Life came out there, and they we kind of did the whole who's on first, what's on second thing, where I was saying I'm photography is not a crime. It's like I'm not asking if it's a crime. What is your, who do you work for? As photographers, remember that video? Yes, um, yes I do. Purple Fudge and Captain Life and everything like that. And uh, Thomas was there. He was doing his thing, kind of laying back in the background, being discreet and filming from a distance, just in case I got arrested and they did something to my videos. And they came walking down the sidewalk. And uh, Eric's like, yeah, that's, who are you with? And he was like, I'm not with anybody. I'm just standing here. I'm just watching what's going on. And uh, they're like, you can move along. But anyway, and Thomas was like, no, I just want to see what's going on. If you watch, go back and watch that video. And then somebody in the comments wrote, LOL, laugh out loud at the epic old guy at what, you know, two minutes and 36 seconds or whatever it was. So that's where the epic old guy moniker came from. I started calling him that from that point on. Oh. So, 
whoever that was that made that comment in that video, watch this. Know that you're the one that created the ethical guy. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> By the way, I'm going to I'll try my best to link all the videos that we talk about in the description. So if viewers, you guys want to see these videos that we're talking about, go in the description box. I should have them linked. Okay. And uh, and Thomas, he contacted me um, after I did. So I'm going to talk about another video. Hopefully, I'm not making Okay, it no, hard. take yeah, talk about as many as you want. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Thomas contacted me after I did the, the Jacksonville Transportation Authority video where I went down and I was filming on the train platform and those two uh, Jacksonville Sheriff's officers trespassed me on the platform. You can't take photographs, you gotta leave. Um, I got real aggressive real quick, went from zero to over aggressive, you know, put me in tufts and arrest me, you know, quick and I had to leave the platform. But anyway, and I, and I was doing that, I was being inspired to do that because of what happened to Carlos on the Metro Rail down in uh, Miami. Uh, Carlos Miller, photographer, son of crime. But uh, you know, Thomas saw that video. He and Thomas, uh, he was diabetic and he had nerve damage and he had some uh, other issues where he couldn't drive. So he was dependent on the Jacksonville Transportation Authority uh, for transportation. He had a he had a pass and he used that. And he saw that video and he was inspired to contact me because he um, saw that the bus drivers and the employees for JTA treated people poorly. Um, and we're breaking laws and violating rules and things like that. So that's that's kind of how me and Thomas met, and I just kind of went from there. He became my um, oh, what is the? He became my he became my research guru, is what he, we called him. Um, if I saw something I was interested in, I would call him and say, "Hey, can you look into this for me?" He would he'd say, "I'd run it to the ground." Uh, he was always there as kind of my backup. Uh, I could trust him um, to just kind of lay back and be across the street or down the road somewhere with a camera uh, protecting me from if I just in case I got arrested and, um, and you know, he would have video to show what happened. So, and Thomas really taught me a lot of things. He taught me, he taught me to slow down, taught me to have patience. Um, he talked me out of some stupid things. Um, you know, I was like, Hey, let's go, let's go do this. I don't remember any specific examples, but let's go do this. And he's like, no, nah, no, nah, why don't you think about that for a little while? Would you, sit back and think about that. I don't think that's a good idea. Um, he's the one that uh, told me to stop doing the open carry videos, uh, open carry while fishing videos. He was concerned that for my safety, and I think he was right. And if you notice, I haven't done an open carry video in quite a few years after I saw those um, bulletins that I was talking about earlier, the sovereign citizen bulletins. Um, don't want to get shot by the cops. But, uh, you know, Thomas, Thomas did a lot of things. And he, um, one of the things that I really go by that Thomas taught me is he said, you want to take away their wiggle room. When you, when you do this um, civil rights investigations or you do these audits, uh, people need to understand that when you go out there, you're putting yourself at great risk. Um, you're, you know, it's not just all fun and games. It's you're putting yourself at great risk. You're putting yourself at being um, physically assaulted or even shot in extreme cases. Um, furry potatoes, he was shot. Um, you're putting yourself at, at risk of being arrested and prosecuted and put in jail. Um, so even though you're not breaking any laws. So you have to, I hate to say you have to, you consider that when you go out there, you put yourself at great risk. And what Thomas Smith by uh, take away their wiggle room is make sure that you've covered all your bases, make sure that you're lawfully present. Uh, make sure that if you do get arrested, that um, you, you, done the research and you make sure that you, you know, you've done your lawfully present. So, because if you get arrested, the first thing you have to do is you have to beat the charges. Um, and if you don't beat the charges, uh, if they don't drop the charges, I'm sorry, uh, and you have to actually go to court and you have to actually go to trial, you, um, you, know, you take away the, their wiggle room. You make sure that you weren't trespassing. You make sure that you weren't buying some sort of obscure law that um, they could get you with um, so that you can beat the charges. You wanna be sympathetic to a jury. Uh, you don't want to come across as a jerk. Um, one of my favorite personal sayings is, is if the cops or the public employees are making an ass of themselves, don't return the favor. Um, that's why I always try to remain cool, calm, and collective. And if they're escalating things, the more they escalate, the more I de-escalate. It's hard to do. It's, it's, it's a natural reaction to want to get right back at them. Um, and I have done that a couple of times. Um, but most, for the most part, you know, they, the more they escalate, the more you de-escalate, back away, try to calm down, try to calm them down. So, uh, 
let's not get off track here, but that's what Thomas was uh, really taught me a lot. It was to calm down, slow down, um, think about it, do some research, and make sure that um, you don't give them any wiggle room to possibly put you in jail uh, or on, wind up on probation or wind up spending time in jail because that's, you know, nobody wants to go to jail. Absolutely not. That's excellent advice. Excellent advice. Um, in fact, I think you're the one who told me that a long time ago about the jury thing. And Yeah, I, and uh, I learned that from Joel Chandler, uh, my friend Joel Chandler. Who, who He's the one that really taught me to, I went around with him and observed him doing his thing with the public records. And he's the one that taught me, you know, if they're saying stupid stuff, you don't really want to argue with them about, about it. Uh, if they're saying, you know, you can't film here. It's against the law. And his, the way a lot of the way a lot of people react to that is, you know, BS, man. I have a right to film. It's the First Amendment. You know, this, that, and the other. But the way Joel does it is, is let me make sure I understand what you're saying correctly. So you're saying that uh, it's illegal to film here? That's right. What what law am I violating? What statute am I violating? You know, ask them questions. Get them to to repeat what they're doing because. Um, when I'm out doing it, I'm not necessarily there to confront them or, you know, do an on-the-spot uh, legal briefing or a session or whatever. I'm there to um, uh, do an investigation, document the way they react, so that later on, hopefully, we can get it straightened out and get them uh, in compliance with our rights. So, <laughs> so I've gotten off of Thomas, but... But no, Thomas, no, no, that's why I, I, this, this yeah. is great. We need to hear but this. Thomas, Thomas is, uh, he was a really great guy, really genuinely good guy, a Coast Guard veteran, an Army veteran, um, uh, just a good, genuine, good-hearted guy that uh, I really trust and really love. And uh, he taught me a whole lot about uh, just chilling out. <laughs> Even though uh, if you were with him on the scene a lot of times, boy, he would, if you pissed him off. <laughs> I was like having to hold Thomas back a couple of times. I was like, Thomas, Thomas, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. So, oh, wow. He's always, yeah. he always seems cool as a cucumber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thomas, really. Um, okay, I have another name to bring, to mention to you. Okay. And what do you have to say about him? Sergeant Guthrie. Oh, Staff Sergeant Guthrie. Um, what a great guy. Uh, you know, he did exactly what I thought naively thought at the beginning uh, when I first started that uh, more cops would do. Um, I thought that more cops would come out and respect the fact that I was out there exercising my rights and would be knowledgeable on the Constitution and our right to film in public. And even if people don't like it, sometimes it's still your right to do it. And, uh, and Sergeant Guthrie came out there and I believe his exact words were, uh, he asked me what was going on. I said that the, uh, the base police, this was in Valdosta, Georgia. Sergeant Staff Sergeant Guthrie, he um, was a staff sergeant at the time, uh, worked for the um, Lowndes County Sheriff's Department. And he was called to the scene because the um, Air Force Base out there in Valdosta I called the cops on us for taking pictures of static displays. That's another thing that, that kills me about military bases. They put static displays of military hardware out there, jets, tanks, things like that, for the public to see and take photographs of. And they put them right at the front gate of these military bases. But if you actually stop and take a photograph of these static displays, they flip out and they call the police and, are, and the police come in and the, the, the military police often will call the local police. And unfortunately, the majority of local police will just feel like they have to show that they're the boss. They can't be shown up by some citizen in front of these military police. So they escalate the situation, wind up arresting people, charging people. But Staff Sergeant Guthrie didn't do that when I he said, so what's going on? He came up, shook my hand. Um, What's going on? I said, uh, oh, I'm just taking pictures of the stack of static displays out there at the base, and uh, they called you. And he said something along the lines of, "Well, they need to go back and learn the Constitution, then, don't they?" And that was just wonderful. And to this day, that is one of my, uh, as far as number of views uh, of videos, that's one of my top viewed videos. I think it's in the top five. Um, and uh, I really like that. I like the fact that the, the positive encounters with law enforcement. Uh, tend to get more more views than the negative encounters with law enforcement in places. So, unfortunately, they're far and few between. <laughs> yeah. Most of them are negative. Right, so. so do you think over the years that, you know, this effort has 
sort of improved things overall or do you think it might have made things worse and made it so that they put more restrictions on us performing first amendment activities uh, overall especially with um the class act like the photography is not a crime uh, that's why I, I like being associated with i think carlos is a more class act i think photography is a crime not a crime it's a more legitimate journalistic um, uh, organization and i think that cops have learned now that and public employees not just law enforcement but they've learned that we have a right to film them for the most part there's still quite a few out there that don't or don't just don't want to accept it but for the most part it's now well known that we have the right to film um, encounters with law enforcement and public and other public employees you see it happen uh, a lot more out there and that, that was one of the big things you know you know you see a lot more in the minority communities where they're they're filming encounters with law enforcement it's it's holding these law enforcement officers more accountable. They're not doing the things that they used to if they know that they're on camera. Um, so I think that has had a positive effect in that in that regard. Um, that the word is out now that we can film, and it's lawful to film. And they they it's unlawful for them to interfere or obstruct with our right to film. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you watch my latest videos, a lot of my latest videos, it's cops coming out and they're really friendly to me and courteous to me. And I say, well, you have the right to film and everything. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, is that, is that because they've learned or is it just because they know that it's me? Right. So, um, I think that, I think it's kind of a combination of both. I think these, that they've been doing, they've gotten these memos and if they see me out there, a lot of them will come out and kind of grandstand for the camera a little bit. Um, and, uh, but they're still doing the right thing. So I don't want to put a negative, but when they say, you know, you have a right to do it continue along uh, but you know what would happen if if it wasn't me that was doing it so we need to find out if it's really um taking effect with, with the law enforcement officers that we have right to film them do you still watch like other people do first amendment tests and stuff do you watch youtube and see what the people are doing yep. out there now uh, i'm really <laughs> happy because when I when I first started doing it back, you know, in 2011, um, there was a lot of people that were saying, "Jeff, I love what you do. You need to come to Alaska and do it here." And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I would love to do that, but you know, it's only one of me, and I live in St. Augustine, Florida. So I'm happy that there's a lot of people. That was one of my goals was to encourage people to get out in their own communities and 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 do it for themselves. You know, the more of us that are out there doing it, the more we can hold public officials accountable, the more that they know that there's people watching. Uh, so it'll, it'll promote accountability through transparency. Um, there's a lot of people out there, you know, I, I'm not going to say that anybody's doing it right or wrong. It's not necessarily that I'm doing it right or wrong, but I, I guess there are a few people that do it for different reasons than I do. Um, uh, but I, I can tell you the guys that I do like, uh, I really like, um, am, I, am I talking loud enough? Can you hear me? Yes, I, I hear perfectly fine. I was just going to ask you that if there's certain people that you enjoy watching. Uh, the people that I do enjoy watching, uh, I really, of course, like Philip Turner. Uh, Philip is just the best. I mean, I watch his videos and I'm in awe of how cool, calm, and collected Philip is. And he's. Um, I think you're one of his influences. Huh? I'm, I'm pretty sure you're one of his influences. Oh, I, I think, yeah, he told me that. I, I, that's, that's, that's really humbling to hear that. Uh, but he's certainly taken it to a. a Whole other level. I like the fact that then that goes back to him being calm, cool, and collective. Now we have uh, what is it? Turner versus Driver, right? Is that the, the case mm -hmm. law? Yes. If if he hadn't have been so cool, calm, and collective, that could have had a, a, a backfire effect, you know. But now we have Smith versus Cumming uh, in his district, his federal district now, and that's wonderful that he's actually established case law in his name. Um, I really like Philip. I really like uh, Otis News Service. Do you ever watch him? Yes, yes, I do. Oh man, he's he's like watching a professional journalist. He's not so much an auditor or an investigator. He does do that, but I mean, I watch his videos and I'm just amazed by him. I just find myself it, a lot of videos I watch if they're like 20 minutes long. I won't watch the whole thing. I'm skipping through it. But with Otis, I'm watching the whole thing. I don't know what he's he's wonderful. I love his work. Um, Gosh, I'm drawing a blank. You know, of course, I love Carlos, but Carlos is, uh, he doesn't really do the going out in the streets anymore. He's more of a journalist, a writing print journalist. Um, 
who else? I like that guy. Um, his disguise, Night Watch. Have you ever heard of him? Night Watch. Oh. Night Watch. Night, Night Watch POV. Um, no, he, I don't think I've ever heard of him. He uh, he's a nighttime photographer. He does really amazing uh, nighttime photography. Yeah. And I guess he, he was and he goes out to ports and refineries and things like that. And he does these amazing um, like time lapse video photographs of um, steam and stuff coming in off of the, the refineries and things like that with the moon in the background. And I guess by nature of him doing that, he naturally encountered security guards, ignorant security guards, and, and ignorant law enforcement officers. So he started documenting that. Yeah, check him out. It's, uh, I think he originally a Night Watch POV, but now I think he calls himself Light Watch. I think he had to change the channel name because of maybe somebody else already had that name or something like that. Okay, um, yeah, I'm definitely look at look out for it. And if I find it, I'll, I'll link it in the description. And, you know, I'm sorry if I'm forgetting anybody, but I'm just kind of drawing blank. I, I love Onus. I love Philip. Um, some of the original old school guys, Daniel Salmon, you know, Dan's great. I love Danny, uh, Dan Salmon. And, uh, okay. so. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, like, you, like I said, you know, a lot of people say, ah, oh, Jeff, you know, you do it right. And there's so many guys out there that are just doing it to try to get views and things like that. And I, and I suppose there are, but you know, I, I don't necessarily, I mean, God, it'd be a boring world if everybody just did exactly what Jeff Gray did on his, his Army Earth videos, you know. Everybody's got their own style. Everybody's got their own way. Oh, like J.C. Playford, you know. I really like J.C. Um, and Dan, you know, they're they're kind of the opposite of me, you know, uh, with the way they do things. But I, I love watching their videos because I think their heart's in the right place. Um, but, you know, I, I just go out and do it the way I do it and try to set a standard the way that I think it should be done. And uh, hopefully people, if they like the way I do it, they'll emulate it. If they think the way I do it sucks, then the way I do it sucks, whatever. <laughs> as long as they're doing it, right? Right, yeah. Okay. Um, and now, anything, any plans for the future? I know that you kind of get out there a little bit and you're a busy man, but do you have, are you still going to do some recording locally or any type of <clears throat> open records, anything in the future? Well, uh, I don't know if I should be saying this. I, I'm, uh, my days off are Tuesday and Wednesday. I intentionally took days off during the week so that I could still do stuff. Um, I'm pulling a lot of public records. I'm working on, um, I'm pulling records um, for Brady List. Uh, it was pretty cool that the USA Today, they just did that huge data dump of, like, I think it was like 80,000 officers that have been, can no longer be cops in 44 different states. Did you see that? No, I was going to ask you about that. What is that? Yeah, USA Today uh, got a hold of all this information. That's basically what I was working on. I know a lot of people, other, me and Mike Hoffman and um, Joel Chandler were kind of loosely working on establishing a Brady, Brady List database. If, if you don't know what, do you know what the Brady list is, Amanda? No. I mean, I, I can, I have an idea because of, it has to do with the Brady laws and with guns, I take it. It's, it's a, it's the prosecution is required to provide, because of the Brady case, the prosecution is required to provide exculpatory um, evidence that can, that could clear the defendant, right? I mean, of course they should, right? If, it, if there's evidence that shows that the defendant is in, innocent, the prosecution shouldn't be allowed to withhold that and hide it, right? So they're required to disclose that information. A lot of times that information is called the Brady, uh, Brady information. And, oh. um, and if a cop is a known liar, um, and he is called a Brady cop. Um, and uh, they're supposed to uh, notify the defendant as well as his defense attorney that this cop is a known liar, that his, his testimony is um, not trustworthy. So, you know, some exculpatory evidence that can get the case thrown out because of that. So anyway, uh, I've been making a public records request for the Brady list uh, from state attorney's offices. And uh, they're supposed to keep a, I don't think they're supposed to keep making a list necessarily. They're supposed to have information that they, they give. So I'm going to ask for cops that are on the Brady list. And I'm trying to uh, compile that. Uh, make a public records request for that. Uh, I'm working on uh, school resource officers in Florida. Um, I'm trying to get their internal affairs summaries, not, you know, not their whole um, file. I'm just requesting their internal affairs summaries because I want to see what kind of law enforcement officers are in these schools with our kids. And, and some, some counties it's theorized that, uh, oddly enough, cops that can't be trusted are dumped in the schools of all places. So I'm trying to get these, um, um, 
internal affairs summaries that just a summary of uh, internal affairs investigation of these school resource officers. Some of them are called youth resource deputies. Um, I'm trying to work on a database of that and do videos of that. So anyway, so in other words, I'm kind of moving more towards pulling public records, doing videos based off of those and putting that information out there. Um, untrustworthy cops. Uh, so people will know who they are and uh, if they encounter these cops and things like that. Or if there's kids going to the schools where these cops are working, they will know that this cop has been investigated for inappropriate contact with a student or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. People should know that. Uh, so I'm kind of, you know, I'm still, a lot of the stuff I just kind of wing it. I just kinda do it. A lot of people that I, that I, you know, like meticulously plan out doing things. But a lot of times I'm just like, I tell my wife, look, I got to get out of the house. <laughs> I've, I've done my honeydew list. I mowed the lawn. I've, I've moved furniture. I've painted. And I've done all the stuff I'm supposed to do. I got to get out of here and go and point a camera at something. Right. So <laughs> I'll just take off and go do it. And then a lot of times that's the best videos that come out. So I'm, I'm, I'm still going to do, um, I'm going to focus on uh, going to public meetings. Uh, on the, I call those my, my sunshine investigation videos because for some reason these there's still public entities in Florida that think that they can make you show ID and sign in and do all this kind of crazy stuff uh, to attend and record a public meeting and they also want to hold uh, public meetings in secure areas of buildings where the public's not allowed <laughs> you know, it's like you're gonna hold let me get this straight you're gonna hold a public meeting in a building where the public isn't allowed to to attend to be there right so um, I'll do more of that. I'll go to these public meetings, I'll try to attend, record it, and just document. Um, a lot of people say, "Why don't you do more?" You know, tell them to go jump in the lake, or whatever. If, if they're telling you what, to do. I'm just there to document, and then maybe later I'd put the video out, send them emails, try to get them to correct it. And then if they don't correct it, if, if necessary, I'll, I'll file a lawsuit against them. So that's but, um, more excellent advice. I think so many people go to jail. And they and they go that route, and they you know, and you know, I, I it obviously you don't have to go to jail in order to, you know, to show how they're doing or how they're not letting you in, and then the public sort of speaks. You can always file lawsuits later and stuff like that. Right. Right. Um, yeah. You know, you don't you don't have to go to jail. I think back uh, getting back with Thomas back uh, back in 2015 when the uh, judge in Jacksonville, Judge Mahan, the chief judge of the uh, the courthouse there in Jacksonville that the taxpayers spent four hundred million dollars on uh, was outrageous. He did an administrative order that he signed as a judge prohibiting speech critical of the judiciary on courthouse grounds or anywhere near the courthouse. So you could be critical of the judges. It was outrageous, and wow. uh, you could film <laughs> the courthouse. He. Um, it was like you you couldn't leave him pretty much look at the courthouse. You couldn't film the exterior of the courthouse. So Thomas and I went out there and we stood on the public sidewalk across the street from the courthouse and started doing like a little report from the from the sidewalk talking about the judge's administrative order. And sure enough, here comes the um, uh, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office with the administrative order telling us that uh, what we're doing is in criminal contempt of court. And if we don't stop and leave the area, then uh, you're being trespassed from the area. and uh, or you'll be arrested for criminal contempt of court. Trespass so, from the area. Yeah, yeah. So we're on a public sidewalk across. <laughs> we have to leave because the judge said you can't be there. So I said I put him on notice that I believe you're in violation of my civil rights. Um, we're leaving, but we're leaving under protest and under duress. We left the area. Um, an attorney, a really great guy, a really wonderful attorney that does a lot of good work for um, people who have been falsely arrested and uh, does a really good civil rights work uh, Andrew Bondarud basically the next day we had went down to the federal courthouse and filed a civil rights lawsuit and um, uh, all the pu publicity that followed that afterwards the judge we wound up dismissing the lawsuit because uh, under pressure of Judge Mahan the chief judge of the Jacksonville Sheriff's our Jacksonville courthouse uh, rescinded his order so there was no need to get arrested and um, we filed the lawsuit we did have to file a lawsuit to get it and to um, get rid of the order and restore their rights, but you know, it worked without getting arrested. But you know, there are there are situations where you know you can't help but get arrested, I guess. But you, if you can avoid getting arrested and not going to the jail, that's a good good idea because once you're in their custody, 
um, you're at their mercy. It's another thing people should think about. Um, you know, I'll take the arrest. I'll take the arrest. Well, a lot of people go into jails and they don't come out a lot. So or they come out and a lot beat up and charged with other crimes and things like that. So it's yeah, just kind of take that into consideration. It's traumatizing. I mean, jail's not a good place to be. It can really, even if it's for a short period of time. I mean, psychologically, it's you know, it's, it's not the place to be. Yeah. If you can accomplish what you're trying to accomplish without doing that, then yeah, I've been arrested five times since I started my YouTube channel. Um, all five times, pretty much all of the arrests were for resisting arrest without violence. Because <laughs> I was filming and refused to show my ID, except for the one arrest where I was arrested for uh, trespassing when I was on the sidewalk outside of school. All those charges were dropped before I um, even went to trial. I never, never really had to have a court date or anything like that because I made sure that I was on solid lawful ground so when they, I knew that if they arrested me, that they had no legitimate charges to charge me with. How many times um, do you think you've been detained? Oh, detained. There's no oh, man. I don't know, man. That's a, that's a good question. I don't think it would be inaccurate to say more than fifty times. Wow. Man detained, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's crazy, man. <laughs> uh, then the next level is being put in cuffs. I don't know. I'd have to go back and look, but I know that actually being arrested, I've been arrested five times. <laughs> and that's when they charged you? With a, yeah, resisting arrest without violence, and all five times the state attorneys, basically, I mean, I, I don't know for sure, but here's what I think the state attorneys, when they saw the video, they saw the charges, and then the state attorney was like, Shh, we don't want nothing to do. This guy wasn't breaking any law. We don't. Good luck with that. They dropped the charges. So. Good, good, and as they should. Um, do you, how often do you, um, do you file lawsuits every time you have an issue with like um, that, or is it select certain uh, times? Or, or? I never filed a lawsuit against the, the Lottie arrest. Um, I guess it'd be easier to just say which ones I, I have filed a lawsuit as far as arrest. I, I sued Orlando, and um, I'm not allowed to talk about the outcome. Um, For sure. I was victorious in that, that lawsuit. Um, Brevard, I was victorious. In, I sued Brevard County for their arrest. I uh, <coughs> came over to the suit, uh, arrested me. Um, I was successful in that. Um, Andrew Bonnaroo is my attorney in all these situations. Mm -hmm. He's awesome attorney um we got the, the school board as everybody knows sued me um andrew bonnery basically got that case uh, dismissed because he filed a motion for summary judgment against them because they uh they sued me for malicious prosecution and uh abuse of process the school sued me for that and uh, public public entities are, are prohibited from suing people for malicious prosecution and abuse of process because it's a retaliatory way to uh, retaliate against you for pursuing them, which is a um, the courts have ruled that that's a violation of your right to petition the government for redress of grievances. So, if every time you sue the government for a civil rights violation, and they could in turn counter sue you for malicious pros prosecution of these processes, you know it's a violation for redress of grievances. So anyway, we got that case dismissed. So I've sued Orlando, Rivard for those those arrests, and. Um, I think that's the only two that I've really seen. I have one more question for you that I've been thinking about, and I can't find this video anywhere. There's this video, and I don't know if this was a result of a lawsuit, but um, I think it was a lady, like a clerk at St. John, she had to make some kind of video to uh, like warn people about people coming with cameras, and she did like <laughs> mock. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I haven't released those videos yet um, because I don't really know how to put them in a format to where it's consumable, I guess, for lack of a better word, for YouTube videos, you know, because you can't make YouTube videos too long. I usually like to try to keep my YouTube just like four minutes or less. Well, that's but, why I can't find it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I, what I did was I sent that to you in a, in a message. Oh, okay. Could have been. It was, it was a while ago, but I, I could never forget that. 
Yeah, I think I, I texted it to you, like a link to it, so you could see it. Um, but basically, the St. John's County School District, the whole stupidity of that was, is they were saying that I wasn't in compliance with their public records policy. And still, if you look at their public records policy, I, what I was doing was perfectly in compliance with their public records written policy that was voted on and approved by the school board. Um, and at first, they were doing the right thing. Uh, because I was going in, I was making public records requests, and they were calling the cops on me and doing all kinds of silly stuff instead of just giving me the records. So what they did is they, um, some St. John's County School District employees did a couple of videos, obviously mocking me in the videos because uh, you know, one of the, the person coming in making a public records request on the video was you know, the school employee. She had a camera strapped to her head. And she was overly acting silly, and she was making a public records request for something stupid. And they did what they did was they did a right way and a wrong way. They showed basically they showed a school district employee calling the cops. And at the end of the video, it was like a big X on it, it says incorrect. And then it showed a second version, the same thing, person coming in making the request, and it showed the school district employee just calling the community relief relations department, asking if it was okay for him to see the, the records and allowing them to see the records. But I guess uh, the, I'm sorry if people can't follow this. The whole point of that was is these videos, they were making these videos and distributing them to um, the schools and things like that to show them how to correctly respond to a public records request. So basically what they were saying is the way they were responding to it was wrong. And they were showing them how to correctly do it. And the day before they filed the lawsuit, Frank Upchurch and David Delaney, the two attorneys that represented the school board and sued me, requested copies of those videos. So before they filed the lawsuit against me, claiming that I was uh, refusing to follow their procedures, they were aware that they were making videos showing that the school was actually doing it wrong and I was correct. So, but I gotta, I gotta, I mean, I'll just put the videos out as they are. The people that know that have followed me for a while will understand what they are. I would love to see it again because that was hilarious. And I spent some time trying to look for it too because I, you know, I wanted to watch it again. It was, it was funny the way they did it. I mean, I, I, I could have got angry about it because, you know, they, they really, it was obvious they were basing it on me as the character. There's a person that was making a public records request in their video with a you know, GoPro strapped to their head and all this stuff. And they were overbearing and all that stuff. But it was actually kind of funny. So, yeah, maybe I'll just, I'll just publish that video. And, uh, that, that'd be great. I remember she was like, I just want to take a picture of the sign-in sheet. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and these are, these, are, uh, these are actually school district, St. John's County School District videos that they produced and put the money into and the time into to make and use it as a training video for their, their employees. And uh, then they, they sued me. Uh, it, it's just, it's crazy. It's hard to explain. But yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or? Um, uh, I guess I could just say my early influences, the, the people that really got me going in this, it, it was pretty cool. It was back 2010, 2011. Um, when I, you know, I've been a truck driver with the same company for since and uh, I still drive for them uh, still for the same company since 1995 and uh, but driving around as a truck driver you know I would see speed traps and I would see you know the towns of Lottie and Hampton and Waldo and, and towns up in Georgia operating these speed traps and they weren't operating them in a in, in my estimation in my observation they weren't operating them in a, in a way that was promoting public safety you know, they, they weren't, you know, what they were doing to me, it looked like they were just, they were hiding uh, and they were just doing it to, to raise revenue. You know, like for example, uh, in Wadi, they would hide at the end of the, uh, the school zone or in the middle of the school zone, and allow a car to speed halfway through the school zone and, after, and then the car would speed on through the school zone and then the cop would take off after the school, the speeder, him speeding through the school zone to pull him over. Whereas other counties, I would notice that they would set the cops up on the, on the, uh, you know, the edges of the school zone before people entered it, but their lights on in plain sight and nobody was speeding. Everybody was slowing down. Um, gosh, what was my whole point of saying all this? Oh, but what, <laughs> so I was seeing that and right around that time, you know, smartphones were coming out with cameras. Uh, YouTube was, was being, was started. Um, and there was people out there like uh, like one of the original videos I saw, David Ridley. Um, you know who that is, David Ridley yeah. with uh, Free Keen up there Free in New Hampshire. Yeah. 
with them. And he was walking down the sidewalk. He was open carrying. He was stopped by a cop. And it was a hilarious video. The cop kept asking him for his ID and kept telling him, he'd tell him where he was going. And they really was like, no, no, that's not going to happen. And uh, then there was the checkpoint videos. And then, of course, there was Carlos um, with his original stuff down there at the uh, Metro Rail Station. And, uh, and the, the cop block guys, the demo and, and Pete and all that stuff. And all that stuff just kind of inspired me to start to get out there and do my do it the way I wanted to do it and uh, create a YouTube channel. And that's kind of how it all started. And uh, I was, I wanted to say this. I love to say this. Uh, I want to make sure and say this every time I get on. My first arrest, I talked about earlier in Lottie. It was, I was scared. Uh, I was shook up by it. And I remember um, calling a demo, Freeman. He answered his phone. I told him what happened. He was there for me. He put the video out there. He organized a call flood. Uh, demanding charges be dropped, um, and, you know, gave me some support, stick in there, man, I know what it's like, hang in there, it's okay, it's not that big a deal, you got to get the charges dropped against you, same thing with Carlos, I called Carlos, and Carlos didn't know me from anything, and uh, he talked to me, and uh, he did the same thing with Pinnock, and put that out there, and, and that put pressure on the state attorney there, and, and uh, in that county where Lottie is at, in Bradford County, to drop the charges, so uh, I, I'm always grateful eternally grateful to uh, Damo Freeman and Carlos for what they did. And um, a couple other people out there too. Uh, you've helped me out when I've been arrested. You've, you've been there for me. Uh, Teresa Richard, uh, she's been there for me. And whatever people want to say about uh, David Warden, the News Now Houston, uh, he's always been there for me when I get arrested. He's always been there to help me and to make phone calls and, uh, and get things taken care of. When I got arrested in St. Augustine, uh, nobody else knew about it except for him. He's the one that put the word out there. I'll always be grateful to David for that as well. Very good. Thank you so much. Is there um, social media? You know, you have obviously Honor Your Oath on YouTube. It's where they can find you. Yeah, uh, Honor Your Oath on YouTube. Uh, I, I work with Carlos with Photography is Not a Crime. Uh, I saw your interview with Carlos. It was a really good interview, by the way. You, good interview. I like the way you do it. Um, Thank you. Um, Carlos was talking about his uh, Be the Media plan uh, where he wants to teach. You know, that's one of mine and Carlos's passion is, is to is to teach people the average average everyday person like you know like we all are to become journalists in their own right and become investigators and know how to pull public records know their rights know how to assert their rights know, know to film interactions with law enforcement protect yourself in the first place know how to pull public records um and hold their uh, public employees accountable in, in, in their neighborhoods and things like that so we're working on that with be the media and we want to go out teach uh, <clears throat> more people how to do this on their own. Excellent. Such a great idea. And uh, Carlos is awesome. Love Carlos. <laughs> yes. Yeah, me too. It was it was so great for me to talk to him too. So I didn't really communicate with him too much um, until that interview, actually. We've corresponded really briefly, like on social media and you know, on Facebook and stuff like that. But, but it was really nice to be able to talk to him. And I watched his, a lot of his videos and I learned a lot about him. So yeah, he's a great guy. <laughs> Carlos is awesome, man. He's so passionate. Uh, I, remember, I remember riding in the car with uh, Carlos Miller and Joel Chandler, two of my heroes. And Joel is Mr. Joel's the smartest guy I've ever met. He's smart. And uh, Joel's, you know, he's he's really and he's not pretentious about it. He's he's intellectually kind of superior to most people that are around him. And um, he was describing something to Carlos. And Joel was like, uh, Joel was describing it as, it's problematic. And and, and uh, Carlos was sitting there and goes, yeah, man, that's a fucking problem. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I, I'll never forget that. I thought that was funny the way Carlos characterizes it. Yeah, man, that's a fucking problem. And Joel was like, that's problematic. And I'm just, <laughs> just loving it. So that was, uh, that was a lot of fun driving around in Miami with uh, Carlos Miller and Joel Chandler. And, uh, everywhere we went in Miami when we were down there, Joel was like, how long is it going to take to get to this place? Carlos, 20 <laughs> minutes. And then uh, how long is it going to get there? 20 minutes. Everything was 20 minutes. Everywhere we went was 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and it really wasn't, but that was fun. Sounds like a good time. Oh, and uh, I want to uh, I want to say hi to my friend Benji Phillips. Do you know Benji? Um, the name is familiar. Yeah, he's Let's go by uh, a different name on YouTube. 
Yeah, he's got a YouTube channel. Um, he, he doesn't have a whole lot of videos out there. Um, but we time, he gives me a lot of good ideas, a lot of good pointers. And uh, But uh, I think one of the best thing that he's done for me so far is he, he informed me and let me know about uh, Landshark beer. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Important stuff. Yeah, so Benji, thank you for telling me about Landshark beer. Um, he said it's just as good as the Secchi's, but cheaper. And I don't know if it's just as good as Dos Equis, but it's just as good as Corona with the lime in it. It's really good. So anybody want to try some land shark uh, beer, it's good stuff. <laughs> right on. All right. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.